I'm going to give you a very brief lesson, history lesson on the Christian church. Founded on the, the work and the ministry of Jesus Christ. It extended in the world through the 11 disciples who were made after Judas. And then by converts to Christianity, um, most significantly Paul. And the church was centered in Rome. And it was like that for several hundred years. And then there was a split. And the Christian church continued only with two branches. The Eastern, which was centered in Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, and in Alexandria, Egypt, and in Rome. So the Eastern church in Istanbul and Alexandria, the Western Christian church in Rome. And so it continued. And then, in the 16th, 15th century, 16th century, uh, there was a huge change. And uh, one of the professors of Christian history at Canadian Mennonite University came here to do a discussion on church history one time. And he said, I'm going to bring the tulip diagram. And you know what a tulip looks like? A stem that just goes like this. And that's what happened to the Christian church. The stem of Roman Catholicism in this 16th century just goes like this with suddenly many leaves coming off of it. And we're going to hear about the first really, really significant one in a play written by John McTavish. Yes, are you? Oh, we both have long memories. Mine goes back 2,000 years. I know. You're a good Catholic. And your friend Luther's story goes back, what, 500 years now? Well, no, 2,000 actually. He was a good Catholic too, in his own way, of course. Oh, try telling the Pope that. <laughs> <laughs> try telling the Pope that the Pope remained a good Christian. Oh, sorry. Or try telling Luther that the Pope remained a good Christian. Oh, come on. Luther broke his vows and tore the church apart. He's hardly in a position to judge. Well, he didn't tear the church apart. He reformed the church. Sadly, not everybody followed his lead. Oh, well, why should they? He was the last guy to have all the answers. This argument could go on for a long time, couldn't it? It has gone on for a long time. In fact, ever since Luther protested the sale of indulgences, that's what started the fuss in the first place. Ah, yes. Luther's famous 95 Theses Against Indulgences. Did you know that he nailed that list of arguments to the door <coughs> of his university church in Wittenberg just around the time that the printing press had been invented? People started running off copies of his arguments, and suddenly the whole of Europe was talking about the brash young monk up in Germany, who had taken on the Pope himself. And from there, the emotions took over, and the first casualty was truth. Well, there was a lot of misunderstanding, wasn't there? On both sides of the fence. Still, something important is at stake here, and I suggest we observe the 500th anniversary of Luther's initial <coughs> blast of the trumpet by retelling the story of the Reformation as clearly and as fairly as we can. Well, I'm all for that. But only if you're really going to be fair and not just pay lip service to the idea. Oh, I'll be fair. Honest. How do you want to begin? Well, we might as well start with John Texel, the Pope's indulgence salesman. He certainly got things rolling. You poor people, you poor souls, have you no fear for your sins? Do you not care that your parents are down there right now in the fires of purgatory, screaming in agony, writhing in flames, no relief in sight, just one torturous experience after another? The Billy 
Graham of his day. Repent and confess your sins and shed out whatever decency you have for these precious little babies. Yes, these indulgences are guaranteed to release the souls of your loved ones from the torture chamber of purgatory and send them straight to paradise. Did you hear that? Straight to paradise. Yeah, that's not the gospel. It's just plain fear mongering. Oh, stop being so critical. I see over there. Someone has a question. Yes, madame. Why do we need to sell indulgences to save our loved ones from the horrors of damnation? Why not simply repent and show remorse for our sins? Well, of course we need to repent and show remorse, but remember, the people in purgatory are dead. They've already passed the point where they could repent. And remember too, Jesus gave Peter the keys to the kingdom precisely to help lost souls like them escape the horrors of eternal punishment. Whatsoever thou bindest in on earth, said Jesus, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou loosest on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Peter and his papal successors have been dutifully binding and loosening ever since. Of course you need to repent. Of course you need to say your prayers and your Hail Marys. But these Pope-approved indulgences seal the deal. The sacraments, God's way of giving you something you can actually see and feel and hold in your hand. And the money, now get this folks, the money is going to help the Pope rebuild St. Peter's in Rome, the greatest church in all of Christendom. So please, please, dig deep in your money bags and show some kindness and love for your poor, dead, tormented relatives. And remember, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Yes, yes, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from Ridiculous. Oh, come on. Absolutely. Tetzel could be crude, but remember, this was the Middle Ages. Everybody was crude by today's standards. Oh, shush. There's Luther now. He'll set the record straight. You mean he'll tear the seamless robe of Christ into shreds? Oh, quiet. How wicked to think that indulgences can take away one ounce of human guilt. If the Pope really has power to set souls free from purgatory, why doesn't he let everybody out? If for the sake of miserable money, he can release uncounted souls from hell. Why doesn't he, for the sake of holy love, empty the place? Indulgences tempt people to think they can buy God's grace. But God's grace isn't for sale. Simply believe and trust in the living Christ. And you will find that, as St. Paul says, the just shall live by faith. Yes, faith alone. Sola fide. Sola fide. Faith alone. What can I say? We all need faith. No one's arguing that. But we also need love and hope. And what the liberation theologians today are calling the preferential option for the poor. Anyway, Luther didn't just spout off about indulgences. He went on to attack the sacraments, the monasteries, the authority of the church. He even attacked the Pope. But, but the authorities were selling the sacraments for money, and everyone from the Pope down was supporting them. The whole church was in denial of the gospel. What do you mean the whole church was in denial of the gospel? You have your favorite passages in the Bible, and we have ours. But no one has the whole truth in his hip pocket. That's simply, oh look, there's Cardinal Eck, a theologian with a tongue. He'll give your boy an earful. Dr. Luther, I draw your attention to these books on the table. 95 Theses for Debate, The Freedom of the Christian Man, The Babylonian Captivity, The Trial of Worms, 
That's where Luther was summoned to renounce his views before the emperor. Eck was the papal spokesman. These books of yours, Dr. Luther, attack the doctrine of indulgences, the seven sacraments, the authority of the church, and other sacred teachings. Do you care to defend all of these books? Or do you wish to reject a part? What? You came here first without thinking about your views? Come on, Luther. Speak up. I came here to debate my views, not to face an ultimatum. But they are your views, are they not? They're certainly not the Pope's views. Certainly not the views of the hierarchy. Oh no, they're the views of one solitary individual. One man in all of Christendom who thinks that he and he alone stand, understands the sense of Scripture. Imagine if every priest or monk decided to interpret the faith for himself. There would be chaos, Luther. Churches on the corner of every street, all of them claiming to possess the truth in their own little Bibles, their own little paper popes. Who can blame the Holy See for pronouncing judgment on such crazed opinion? And Luther, my friend. No, no. Look at me, Martin. Such crazed opinion cries out for judgment. And you, above all, must realize how terrible the penalty of such judgment will be. I therefore ask in all humility, will you renounce Wait. it? Why humble by bully me into submission? Convict me, if you can, from the Bible. Prove from the prophets and the Gospels that I am wrong. And I will be the first to throw my books into the fire. You're not listening, Luther, are you? You're doing what every heretic has done. Us, Wycliffe, the poor men of Lyon, they all turn to Scripture. And they all interpret it as they wish. They do not. We listen in Scripture for the voice of God. The voice of God? The voice of your own delusions? How do you know it's the voice of God? How does the Pope know? The Pope is the Vicar of Christ. Says who? Says Christ himself. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter is the rock on which Christ builds his church. And that rock, I can assure you, is solid. Now, what don't you understand about this? All I'm saying is that if the Pope is all you say he is, why is he defending the practice of indulgences? Look, we're going in circles. There are good Popes and bad Popes. Wise Popes and not so wise. So what? That's no excuse for reorganizing the whole of Christ's church and effectively rewriting the New Testament. If there's a problem with indulgences, God will take care of it in God's own way. God, Luther, not you or me or anybody else. Would you have us believe that the Holy Spirit has passed over this court, passed over the entire hierarchy of Christ, of Christ's church and spoken to Martin Luther alone? The Holy Spirit spoke to John the Baptist, and the priests and scribes did not understand him. He spoke to Jeremiah, and the chief priest took him and dropped him down a well. He spoke Stop to Stop it! Will you admit that you were wrong when you described indulgences as the pious defrauding of the faithful? And will you recant your attacks on the authority of His Holiness the Pope? And will you repudiate these books of yours and the errors they contain? And Dr. Luther, I hardly need to remind you how terrible the penalties would be 
If you're not retracting Since it, your grace and their lordships desire a simple reply, I will answer. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture or evident reason, I am bound by the biblical authority cited by me, and my conscience is held captive to the word of, word of God. I will renounce nothing, for to go against conscience is neither safe nor honest. Here stehe ich. Ich kenne nicht anders. Gott helfe mir. Amen. Here I stand. God help me. God help you and me. <coughs> that should have been it for Luther, but it wasn't, was it? Nope. The court gave him a safe conduct, and his friends kidnapped him on the way home and managed to hide him in a castle until the danger passed. Oh, the man was lucky. You could say that. Anyway, his supporters grew in numbers and strength. And when Luther emerged from the castle, he led a renewal of church life. <laughs> renewal, my eye. Luther split the church right down the middle. It was his radicalism that made compromise impossible. How else could there be reform? But there was reform. The things Luther condemned have long gone. There was tremendous reform later in the 16th century. But would that have happened if it hadn't been for Luther? Would the religious wars of the century, 17th century have happened if it hadn't been for Luther? Ah, you can't blame Luther for those wars. If the papacy had listened, instead of excommunicating him and persecuting his followers, those wars would never have taken place. The fact is, Luther rediscovered God's liberating grace in Christ. Without that discovery, you can still have a rich and powerful ecclesiastical institution. But where's the gospel? Where's the... Wait a minute. Are you saying that we Catholics know nothing of the gospel? That only you Protestants know anything about God's love and forgive? No, 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 no of course not. It, it's just that... Look, I don't want to insult you or anything. But this friend of yours did some pretty loveless things, more than loveless, actually, downright. It's okay. I know that Luther wasn't always a saint, but you've got to understand the time and the culture of the day. I've got to understand the time and culture of the day? Well, yes. But there's nothing here that you need to understand? No, I didn't say that. Oh, no. You just implied it. Look, you're glad to pin our hearts to the stake on account of something that happened 500 years ago. But the minute the shoe was on the other foot... Okay, all right. I'm not suggesting that Luther was infallible. Oh, he was fallible, all right. But when he goofs up, what happens? Nothing, right? Our guy goofs up, at least in your judgment, and suddenly the whole church needs to be reinvented. But you keep claiming that your guy is infallible. Only when he speaks ex cathedra on matters of faith and morals. And that happens about once every 200 years. <laughs> we could drop this little 19th century dogma and nothing would really change. Hey, wait, hey, he's back. Yes, the stubborn old mule is back. And I must say I have to agree with my friend here. I did do some terrible things. When the peasants revolted, did I speak up for them? No, I encouraged the princes to get in there and slaughter the poor devils. And when the Jews refused to join our newly reformed church, I got so mad. I said some terrible things, unspeakable things, that people have been using against the Jewish people for centuries now. War, slaughter, <coughs> concentration camps. I sometimes wonder if, it, it, 
It's all right. It's all right, Martin. You once said that God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. Isn't that what sola fide means? We're all crooked sticks, justified by faith and faith alone. And what was that other thing you liked to say? Sin boldly, but even more boldly, trust in the living Christ. You sinned boldly, Luther, but you also trusted boldly. And now, what can we say but for everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. This is the healing time. Time for Christ's people to stand together and say as clearly and forcefully as possible that no church can boast unless it boasts in the Lord. Wir sind alle Pepper. We are all beggars. Hoc est vero. This is true. Amen. Amen. Great hymn of Luther, number 262. Um. 